Mr. Daly. <sighs> Mr. Kaplis and Mr. Breakstone, we're going to take a, a short break. Uh, I mean, Mr. Whiteleaf, we're going to take a short break after uh, Mr. Daly has uh, used his time, so don't be surprised. <laughs> Good morning, Thank Mr. You. Daly. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Kaplis. Uh, my name is William Daly, and I'm here on behalf of Dr. Hochberg. Uh, we're requesting that the court determine that there was factual error in the trial court's finding that Dr. Hochberg deliberately misled the jury in the first trial, testifying he had knowledge about a fact that was central to the case when he had no such knowledge. Um, Mr. Daly, let me ask you this as a procedural matter. I'm just curious. When the judge ordered um, Dr. Hochberg to be subject to a deposition, which admittedly is an unusual occurrence, is there any reason that you did not seek relief um, under 211.3? I didn't represent Dr. Hockey. Uh, is there any, I don't mean you. I mean, is there any reason your client didn't seek um, relief under 211.3? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of what was going on. I was notified afterwards and came in to represent Dr. Hochberg first at the April 1st hearing. I don't think you waive your rights by that. You know, it's kind of an option either to try 211.3 or just to do right. apparently what you've done, which is, you know, take an appeal. But anyway. Uh, the court went on and indicated he, meaning Dr. Hochberg, no doubt believed that a patient with Mrs. Wojcicki's medical history would not have been included in the study, but he testified without basis that, as a matter of fact, no cancer patients were included in the study and de deliberately created the false impression that his testimony to that effect was based on his review of study, uh, study data. Now, that's the finding that gives rise to the sanction that was imposed on Dr. Hochberg. Dr. Hochberg is acknowledged to be a national authority with regard to the field of neuro-oncology. His testimony, I suggest, was both medically sound and medically truthful. Uh, I, I think what we don't have at issue here is his uh, expertise. What we don't have at issue here is um, uh, whether or not it was medically sound. What we have at issue here is whether it was truthful, correct? And uh, if I could uh, just observe, Your Honor, that during uh, the trial in this case, the NIH study was introduced. When Dr. Hochberg was brought forth as an expert witness, he was asked on at least nine occasions hypothetical questions that included uh, a basis of based upon your education, training, and experience. Dr. Hochberg had every right to believe that that was the predicate for the question. There was a question that said that included also based on your review of the study. That's right. Okay. What did that, what did that mean, the study? The study was the published study in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. How did he know from the published study whether there were any cancer patients in it or not from the published study? He knew based upon his clinical experience that, that patients with these presenting symptoms would not be uh, a, a proper a patient to include within the study. If you take a look... That's Mr. Daly. The problem with that is that's not what... Um, that, that wasn't the question and that wasn't the answer. I know that there's a dispute about presenting with as opposed to having a history of, correct? Yes. Uh, but I'm looking at his answer, which is one of the answers, and I realize it's difficult when you take a single answer, but his thing, there were no patients with breast cancer in the study, either part one or part two of that study. Right. And that was a correct answer. It was, it was a correct answer as far as being medically correct. It was a correct well, answer. Well, it's not a question of whether it's medically correct. It's a question of whether he knew anything about that study. Correct. He, he was familiar with the published study. He, indi he indicated he was familiar with the published study. He knew, based upon his experience as one of the most active researchers at the Mass General with over 30 uh, studies that he has acted as a principal investigator in. Yeah, but we're not he, talking but, about that. We're talking about the study. Go back. The actual question was preceded by a question. Dr. Hochberg, are you familiar with the NIN study that was published in December 1995? Yes. And as part of this study, Dr. Hochberg, based on your review of it, 
together with your knowledge, training, and experience, which is just you have to say that in order to get the question in, as a neurologist, were there any patients included in that study who presented with cancer? I mean, doesn't the question, particularly on the heels of following a question of whether you're familiar with the study, suggest that the doctor is being asked whether as part of this study there were patients in it, not whether as part of his experience are cancer patients included in such studies. But to Dr. Hochberg, those words were very important. But Based it's to the jury. Based upon your knowledge of the study plus your education, training, and experience. And that was the question that was given to Dr. Hochberg. We can't isolate the one item of the study, which is what the plaintiffs would like to do on pages uh, 10, 37, and 39 of their brief. No, I'm looking at Judge Kottmeyer. I, frankly, I'm not interested. I mean, I am interested, but I'm looking at Judge Kottmeyer and what Judge Kottmeyer, I mean, Judge Kottmeyer was there. Right. Judge Kottmeyer is watching the evidence going in. Judge Kottmeyer is going back to make quite sure that she's got the questions and she has post trial discovery to make quite sure. And, and, uh, if and he, as, as I understand it, and, for, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that your client said, I was, I was testifying about the study because I had a conversation with another person who told me, and that's why I answered the questions that's, that way. And then it turns out that the judge makes a factual finding that he didn't have any such conversation. If we can stay with the original question, and then we'll get to the conversation. Sure. The original question was based upon... Uh, your review of the study and your education, training, and experience. And it's that latter phrase that you contend, which admittedly is pretty broad, your education, training, and experience, that gives him some latitude beyond the actual um, Absolutely. scope of the study. Absolutely. Even though the putting it that in that phraseology is kind of a standard way you've got to do well, it. Well, it is to a lawyer, but not to a doctor. But right. then, but then we, as I understand it, counsel for the defendant follows up. In other words, I understand the first one because it says, uh, you know, on your review of the study, together with, you get that in. Then counsel zeroes in. Were there any patients who were part of that study who presented with breast cancer? That's not coupled with and together with your knowledge training. But, but the doctor had already testified in response to at least nine questions that included his education, training, and experience, or nine questions that were put to him, that uh, there were no, no patients who presented with cancer who were included in the study. The doctor would have to pass out that somehow now that basis, that predicate. Uh, no, and, and Judge Kotmeyer recognizes that, and she says, Okay, because this now takes the plaintiff aback. And so the plaintiff then says, how many patients have a bad back? No one knows. How many patients have a hip replacement? No one knows. How many patients have male pattern of baldness? No one knows. And then gets down to how many patients in the NINS study had cancer? Right. Zero. Right. No yeah. one knows, and he says, excuse me, Zero. He's talking and, about the study. And if you notice, Dr. Hochberg said in response to the question, was cancer an exclusion for participation in the study? He answered no. Cancer in the abstract was not. Patients in his mind presenting with cancer were. It would be like someone asking me in the Old Testament, are there any references to hip uh, injury? I'd say no. Or to uh, arthritis? I'd say no. If they ask me, are there any references in the Old Testimony to Larry Bird, I'd say zero. So it's the same thing. This is a doctor who has devoted his life to the treatment of these kinds of problems. And, and he testified based upon that clinical experience. That's what he said he did. Could you okay, but could you clarify one fact for me? There's this reference to um, patients being excluded from the study for a, a list of reasons and then a catch-all phrase about, you know, something, you know, any other serious disease. Was that in the published article on the study? There were, there were uh, in the published article, no, Your Honor. In, in, uh, so where, in, did that, where does that come from? That, that comes from the exclusion criteria 
that are included within the CD-ROM. It would be question number 11 on page 462. A patient has a exclusion criteria. Patient has a serious medical illness that is likely to interfere with this trial. Now, if you keep in mind, Dr. Tilly was the lead author in a 1997 uh, publication, major publication, outlining the reasons why patients were excluded from this study. You'll remember there were 17,000 patients, roughly, who were randomized to, to get to the, uh, to the, to the 600-odd that were included. Over 700 of those patients were excluded because of a serious coexisting problem. So we have a situation here where Dr. Hochberg is talking about a patient presenting with an active cancer having just received chemotherapy. That was the predicate he was given. Okay, but here there's another answer that um, following the questions that the Chief Justice uh, read you a moment ago, the um, plaintiff's attorney says, what is that you're holding in your hand, sir? This is the same um, this is cross-examination by Mr. Brakesmill. <coughs> And the doctor's answer is, I'm holding my hand, this is the publication of the study. Okay, it's the publication. You asked me about the actual NIN study. That's the underlying data, right? right? right. And, the, and the answer is zero. How does he know that? He the knows. Pu- because he never read the actual underlying data. He goes on, the publication of the study makes no mention of the cancer patients. The actual study contained no cancer patients. How he, does he know that? He, know, he knew based upon his... Uh, experience in treating patients with these very problems that they would not be included. Dr. Hochberg's testimony. Well, you absolutely, I mean, you you absolutely as a doctor can know that without having looked at the study data? Absolutely. And you take a look at Dr. Roy. Then why did he call Dr. Tillery if he knew that? Why did he call If you noticed, he said his clinical knowledge allowed him to give that opinion. He called to confirm with Dr. Tillery. He never and, and said in his deposition testimony that he called Dr. Tilly. Is it Tilly or Tillery? Till, Tilly. Tilly. He never said he called her to confirm. He said he called her to ask. And so you're saying and, he knew it from his clinical knowledge. Then why, I don't understand why he had to call her to ask. Because he called her where she was the, the chief uh, uh, statistician uh, in the study to confirm that there was no one in there. Now, his testimony But is, you're telling me that he absolutely knows from all his years of experience that no such cancer person would be included in there. Dr. Hochberg's testimony was no different than the testimony of the plaintiff's expert. If you look at Rudolph's testimony, he said a patient such as Mrs. Has a patient, has a patient such as Mrs. Wojcicki ever received TPA at the Mass General, to your knowledge? His answer was no. That's their own expert. And you might say to yourself, where is this point of malpractice case going when their stroke expert says at the Mass General she would not have gotten TPA and the claim is that Dr. Carragher should have given it? I understand. That's not the issue that's before us today. Well, it, yeah, the, the question, and, and it seems to me that's before us, is whether or not whatever was in, in your client's mind, whether he might, he might not have been listening to the questions he might have been bringing to him his understanding. And it seemed to me that what happened here was Judge Kottmeyer looked at this, looked at it very carefully, gave him an opportunity. He explained uh, that he, you know, he had, I mean, you look at it, and he's talking about the study. He's talking about the study. And there's a fine line distinction that he's drawing between presenting with as opposed to had a history of. And... An awful lot of it, it seemed to me, ultimately turned on whether or not he had had a conversation with somebody with access to that underlying data, and she makes a finding um, that says he he never had the conversation. Uh, In anticipation, there might be a rather lively discussion. Mr. Gould has ceded to me a couple minutes of his time. He doesn't have to cede until we tell you that he has to cede. (laughs) He he will get his full time. (laughs) If you take a look at the background with regard to that telephone conversation. Dr. Hochberg, prior to he, the time he ever testified, made two telephone calls, one to Mr. M- uh, Dr. Mahler, who was, I'm going to call him the chief administrator of right. the study, the second one to Dr. Tilly's telephone call. No question those telephone number. No question those two calls were made. After that, uh, Dr. Uh, Hochberg told Mr. Gould that he had had this conversation. On the day of the trial, immediately before Dr. Hochberg got to testify, there was a conversation as they were having some sandwiches where Dr. Hochberg repeated the fact that he had spoken 
mentioning a principle. No, no, I understand. Uh, there was no reason for Dr. Hochberg to be saying these things at that point in time. It was no issue. Then uh, we, we get to the situation where Dr. Tilley is deposed. Dr. Tilley is advised before the deposition that I'm coming down to attack her. Any time you take a deposition within 10 or 15 minutes, you know whether or not you're going to get open, candid answers. It was apparent to me I wasn't. And a, a view of the... Of the of Mr. The, uh, Daly, I am, I am going to cut you off only because all of that may be correct. We'll look at the record, but we've got Judge Kottmeyer who actually knew and watched and made all of these determinations, correct? But, uh, right, right. But if, if you will look at the testimony of Dr. Tilly, the fact that she indicates... Is the videotape in, in evidence here? Uh, is it part of the record? I don't think the transcript is. The videotape, I don't know, has come down. We could certainly make that available. Did, did Judge Kottmeyer watch the videotape, or did she take the evidence and transcript? She had the video available okay. to her. Right. And uh, Dr. Dr. Tilly indicated she always returns her telephone calls. When she's out of town, the calls are sent to her. She never remembered the fact that an email had been sent by Dr. Uh, Hochberg. Uh, she, there was a response. Dr. Hochberg had a response from the NIH sending him in the direction of the CD-ROMs at the time that he testified and indicated the data would be on the CD-ROMs. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Tilly indicated she didn't respond because uh, she thought that Dr. Hochberg already had the answer. Well, she knew most respectfully that he didn't have the answer because the specific question that he asked about wasn't included in the CD-ROM. But you can see from the affidavits that we obtained from three of the principal investigators, the safety data coordinator, and two uh, outstanding neurologists in the area, that the testimony given by Dr. Hochberg was entirely accurate. And I, I would just suggest to the court that it's a frightening thing if an expert testifies, uh, as, as, as Judge Kottmeyer said, believing in what he says and believing that it's accurate and believing that he's responded, and he responded to these questions uh, in keeping with the preparation. Uh, he had reviewed with Mr. Gould what I his te testimony was going to be, and it was entirely consistent. There was no reason for Dr. Hochberg to think he was misleading anyone. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Thank you. Mr. Gould, we won't penalize you, but uh, please try and keep within the time period. May it please the Court, I'm David Gould, trial counsel for Dr. Carragher in this case. Uh, I have been a trial lawyer for 30 years, and my practice has exclusively been limited to representing physicians in medical malpractice actions. This case, as far as I am concerned, was tried with honesty and integrity, much as I have tried every case. Mr. Gould, your, your, your reputation is not at issue here. Let me ask you this. Well, it is, Your I, Honor. I, I look at these questions. I look at these questions, and I, and I say, and, and the trial judge was, was there, uh, maybe something else was in your, your physician, your, your expert's mind, but the way he answered these questions leaves me with the impression that he had reviewed the underlying data and that anybody who had any diagnosis of cancer, not currently presenting with as a patient, but anybody who had any diagnosis of cancer was not part of the study. I would very much like to comment upon that, if I may. I retained Dr. Hochberg as an expert not to testify on questions relating to the standard of care, but strictly relating to the question of causation, because I felt that he had specific expertise in an area that would be helpful to the jury in a case like this. He is a neuro-oncologist. He treats patients who present to emergency departments with neurologic conditions who have concomitant cancers, much as Mrs. Wojcicki had in this case. Right. And in retaining him, I felt that he particularly could address the issues relating to whether in a patient who presented with cancer, right. TPA would have been an appropriate treatment modality to be employed. Right. That is the sole reason 
that I sought out Dr. Hochberg's expertise. Did you include that, that carefully, that statement, in your answer to, um, as to what the expert was going to testify to? I believe so. That whether in a patient who presented with cancer, TPA would be uh, properly administered? I believe so. Okay. I believe so. And in fact, uh, Judge Cowan, when Dr. Hochberg testified, there was never an objection made by plaintiff's counsel okay. at any point as to the scope of the inquiry that I was making with regard to his expertise. Now, I, I understand that some people have raised an issue with respect to that, but I don't think that's essentially in front of us at the Fine. moment. I, and I, I agree with that. Right. Uh, but going back to the questions relating to Dr. Hochberg's expertise well, in could my I, Could I ask questions? you a question? I'm sorry, I, that I, I didn't understand, um, and it's, you may not be able to answer it because it's uh, in the other side's brief, but there's a footnote that says, when the trial judge inquired of Hochberg at the hearing regarding his testimony, quote, that all of this information about cancer patients is in the cd Rome's unquote, Hochberg admitted that after actually reviewing that data on the single cd Rome, he was in error. He also testified, quote, when I finally opened the CD on January 9th, 05, it was clear that the information was not there, unquote. So I don't understand. Did he actually admit at the hearing that he was in error on something? And if so, what was the something? Well, I'm not sure I can answer it in that way, but let me give you the chronology of events. When I met with Dr. Hochberg in preparation for the trial, this, this is well, all in, in the yeah, record. I've read, you, okay. I've read the brief. I've read the record. I just don't understand that the um, – so I, I'm familiar with the chronology, but I don't understand this statement that um, – I haven't read the entire transcript – that he said he was in error. I thought, his, I thought his position, and as I hear Mr. Daly explain it, his position is that he was never in error, that he was right all the way along. That's right. He was. He never reviewed the CD-ROM prior to the trial. And, in fact, that was the basis – of Judge Kottmeyer's ordering of a new well, trial in this case. I'll have to ask the plaintiff what okay. they mean by that then, because it says uh, after actually reviewing that data, he admitted he was in error. I'm not sure I can answer okay. that. Okay, okay. But the basis of Judge Kottmeyer's ruling ordering a new trial in this case is essentially that Dr. Hochberg gave a misimpression that he had reviewed the study data. Now, it's, it's quite interesting in Judge Kottmeyer's post-trial rulings that on one occasion is stated in the addendum to my brief on page 21. She states that, in fact, Dr. Hochberg believed what he said was true, but, but perhaps even more startling. On appendix page 486, Judge Kottmeyer makes the statement, the falsity of the trial testimony is not an issue of concern to me because after the fact, it may have turned out that what Dr. Kochberg said was true. So she is essentially making a finding that, in essence, what he is saying is probably accurate. And she goes on to say in some of her documents in this case that the jury result, in fact, in this case was correct, and that if there was a new trial to be ordered, it is not likely that the plaintiff would prevail. So the question really comes down to what Dr. Hochberg meant when he talked about the study and presenting with. I explained to the judge in the first post-trial hearing here that I was very specific in asking Dr. Hochberg questions relating to patients like this who presented with active, unstaged breast cancer. She said that she did not know, in fact, what the term presenting with meant, and that it created an ambiguity and a misimpression that blurred the distinctions in this case. Mr. Gould, let me go back to this. Certainly. She make, Judge Kotmeyer, the trial judge, makes as a finding, correct, and, and you, essentially, essentially her finding, it seems to me, is the following. At the time he testified, we've only got one jury, right? We've got Correct. one jury, and they are the fact finders, and they are listening. That Dr. Hart, your expert, testified as to the existence of the fact when he did not know whether the fact was true. 
That was her finding. Right. Now, as a, as a practical matter, Dr. Hawker... But wait, let me finish. I'm sorry. Okay, and then the second, he, that the expert deliberately misled the court and the jury. So now she's saying, I'm making a finding as to me, she's there, and the jury, that he had reviewed the study data and in particular, deliberately created the fal false impression in his trial testimony that he had reviewed the CD-ROM containing the actual data set and that it showed that no cancer patients were included in the study. And when I look at his trial testimony, it looks as though that is what he testified to. That is not my understanding of the testimony. Here, here's, when, the, here's this key sense. You asked me about the actual NIN study, and the answer is zero. So he's giving the impression that he saw the actual study, and the answer is zero. Well, I don't believe that he gave that impression at all. But the judge found that he did. I understand that. And, and I believe that she misinterpreted the scope of his testimony. If I had felt that for one second, I would have corrected that immediately. Is she plainly wrong? I, absolutely. Uh, I believe. Why, but why was she plainly wrong as opposed to this being a question of interpretation? Be, because I think she got caught up in some of the terminology. For example. But, but on, on the record, yeah, tell us why on the record she was plainly wrong. I, I will say, I can respond to that quite assertively if I may. On several grounds. Number one. When I talked to Dr. Hochberg in direct testimony about pa patients who presented with cancer. No, but that's a different question. Well, I can understand the difference between presented with and history of, and although the doctor might have made it a little more clear to the None jury, the I can understand None of the had him. cancer. But, and but, he's saying that the study shows. How does he know what the study shows when he didn't review the He knows what the study shows because he advised me and he advised Dr. Carragher. Is this in the test? Submitted. Is this in evidence? What he advised you? I have an affidavit as part of the record, okay. as, yeah. as does. So it's in, it's in evidence. A, absolutely. As but does Dr. Carragher. Were cancer patients involved in the study? Not active cancer patients. patients Not who patients had, had who cancer. presented with the type of cancer that this lady presented with. There were no patients like so that in the study. Where is the prejudice to the plaintiff? I don't believe there is any prejudice and to the Judge plaintiff. And Judge Kottmeyer virtually admitted that in that finding, or whatever it was, that you talked about a few minutes ago. I, there is no prejudice to the plaintiff. And in fact, I, I strongly believe... The doctor's testimony was entirely accurate in, that, right. in the respect that we're talking about right now. That's right. His testimony was entirely accurate. The jury verdict in this case was sound. It should stand. And I would ask this court to reverse Judge Kottmeyer's ruling ordering a new trial. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Thank we'll you, take Ryan. a short break. Mr. Weiser. <laughs>
the NINDS study contains cancer patients. And indeed, those patients had a diagnosis of malignancy. He acknowledges that there were some cancer patients in the study. Oh, correct. But we, we know that now. But we do not know the, the, what appears to be the critical point, whether that was active cancer undergoing active treatment or whether it was simply part of their prior medical history resolved long ago. If we're in a situation where we don't even know whether what Dr. Hochberg said is accurate or is not accurate, and nobody's going to be able to establish that one way or another, it seems a bit odd to have a new trial over this whole Your issue. Honor, what he said was there were no cancer patients. Sure. And, and Mr. Judge, White, can I ask you a more, more fundamental question? This, this sort of bothers me about what, what's, what's happening here. Witnesses at trials give inaccurate testimony all the time, either because they're sloppy, uh, because they're doing it on purpose, uh, because of bad memory, or for lots of reasons. Or they're just, don't listen to the question carefully, give an answer that turns out to be misleading. Um, the normal cure for that is called cross-examination, not a new trial. And it, what puzzles me here is everything that you're now talking about was material that, that the plaintiff's counsel could have been prepared to deal with <clears throat> and cross-examine Dr. Hochberg in a slightly different way than was done at trial. Your Honor, we could not have done that. How could we have gotten all 624 patient records? How could we have gotten the 59 patient records from 30 or 40 different hospitals I take it, Mr. Whiteley, what you would say in response to that, which is what Judge Kottmeyer did, was to say you cross-examined him and he repeated and you tried to do it on the basis of how do you know, how do you know, how do you know, and he said, there I know. There were no patients. Right. And then he went on, Your Honor, to say uh, that to give the impression, as Judge Kottmeyer found, that he was familiar with the study data. Correct. Okay. And on had, redirect... included your expert from becoming familiar with the study data and being able to respond to what everybody knew was the central issue in the case, namely, is someone with present active cancer an appropriate candidate for TPA or not? You knew that was the theory of the defense. But that's different, Your Honor, from what we're talking about here. Well, can the I experts testified one way or another, should she have gotten TPA? And if it had just stopped, with Dr. Hopper saying, it's my opinion that she should not have gotten it, as opposed to going further and saying, this report, which is central to our case, is not applied because there were no cancer patients. Well, then why didn't you move to strike that as being beyond the scope of what he had provided you in discovery, if you were surprised by that? Your Honor, the... Oh, why didn't your client... Your our <laughs> hindsight is always 20-20. Uh, there could have been a, probably but other But you don't get a motion for new trial yeah. unless something is newly discovered. And well, you can, motion for new trial isn't a vehicle for making up for mistakes at trial. What was newly discovered was, as, as Judge Kottmeyer found, we, we were not notified that he would testify to this Okay, so first point. of all, you stand up and you object and move to strike because you weren't notified. Secondly, you, call, you had two days to call your expert. But One did day I understand it? Oh, you had time to call your expert between the time when after Dr. Hochberg testified and the time the case went to verdict. So instead of calling your expert after you get an unfavorable verdict, why don't you call your expert before and you know, question him and, and, if necessary, bring him back? The only thing I can tell you, Your Honor, is that Mr. Brakestone cross-examined in the way that he thought best at the time, and he did not appreciate the magnitude that the false evidence in this case would have until the trial actually ended. Well, but so that isn't a, a reason for a motion. New trial has to be newly discovered evidence, and so it isn't newly well, discovered actually, because there was a Your potential Honor, the, for discovering it. This is a Rule 59 motion, although newly discovered evidence under Rule 60B can provide a basis under Rule 59. The, the issue here is much more central. Was justice done in this case? Was there something that affected the if, if you, this if trial? If we allow motions for new trial to be based on a combing and a parsing of every word of every trial, the way you suggested here, there's going to be a motion for new trial that probably should be granted in almost every case. Your Honor, in, in the centuries that this Court has been considering the trial justice's findings, uh, their conclusions based upon clear and convincing evidence, you've always upheld the discretion of the Court. 
if it's based, if there's, a, if there's no abuse of discretion, Judge Kottmeyer found this was false evidence, not true evidence. It was misleading. But she made very on few findings issue. on whether it was newly discovered. She has only one footnote devoted to that. And frankly, in my mind, it doesn't answer the question. But this is Rule 59, Your Honor. It's much broader than a Rule 60B motion. Well, that the could, restatement says that. Her, this, she does, though. I mean, it, it's so hard. She does uh, have these references to the trial would probably come out the same way, and even a sense of regret. It's sort of too bad I have to do this because it seems wasteful because, the, you know, it, this was a perfectly good trial until this happened and probably would have come out the same way. If we're talking about a, a broader Rule 59 sense of, you know, was justice done, the, what she seems to be suggesting is that justice was done, <clears throat> notwithstanding the fact that it was perhaps tainted by uh, false Res evidence. Respectfully, I think not. And you, if you look, especially in the transcript from her June hearing, which is part of the appendix in page 1125, I believe, she said it was, it, it was false evidence on an important part of the case. She doesn't know. We can't know. None of us can know if the trial will be the same or would have been different. Mr. White, but the standard in Davis versus Elevator Railway and Welshville Judge. versus Galvin is not that we have to demonstrate that the trial would be different. Huh? But Mr. That the White, trial was let me tainted. ask you this, um, which may not be relevant to this point, but what did your experts say about the care this woman should have been given? Our experts, our experts both said that she was eligible to receive TPA and should have received TPA, and had she received the TPA, it would have likely made a difference in her outcome. That and, she would was, have been and did your experts say anything about the study? Well, they, what they said about the study, Your Honor, was that the study set a new standard of care. The study but you introduced this study in evidence. This wasn't introduced by the defendant. You introduced the yes. study. Yes. Okay, so you introduced the study in evidence. The main question in the trial is whether a patient presenting with cancer should get TPA TPA and a stroke should get TPA, and you introduce the study. Isn't it your responsibility? It doesn't the question jump out at you? Were any cancer patients in the study? No, Does this the, apply the, to cancer patients? Does this apply issue, to my patient? The main issue at trial was should Mrs. Wojcicki have gotten right. TPA? Mrs. Right. Wojcicki, who was found within minutes of her stroke and taken to the hospital immediately when she's right in the most efficacious window for this kind of treatment. And this report said she's the perfect candidate. She's, been, she's in the hospital within that three-hour window. She's diagnosed as having an ischemic stroke. She and and I, ta I take it your position, Mr. Whiteleaf, is the following. There is a study, correct? There's a study. It's published in the New England Journal or JAMA or The Lancet or someplace or other. There's a study. And there's nothing to indicate from the face of the study that because she was presenting with cancer, the, the, the publication doesn't say that. The scientific journal doesn't say that, correct? And the exclusion criteria are not there either. Okay. Right. So your expert says, according to this study, based on this report, right, um, she was a perfect candidate. It's this study plus what the treatment that. has now become. The, the I understand that. Outcome. And then the expert for the doctor gets up and says, um, no, in fact what the study shows is that there were no cancer, no cancer patients at all. Correct? That he said there were none included in the study. That's Not included in the study. No cancer, no patients who had cancer were included in the study. How do you know that? Because you've read the study. Mr. Blakestone has read the study. Your experts have read the study. Well, he's, you know, we're now looking at it in the context because, in essence, he suggests to the jury, I've looked at the CD-ROMs, and moreover, I've called somebody. Well, no, the I called somebody was his okay, excuse later. afterwards. Okay, so and then, so, so he says, yes. I've looked at the CD long, right? That's the impression he gave clearly. Okay. Isn't that then your opportunity to call up your expert on Wednesday afternoon <clears throat> and say, do you realize what Hochberg just said? I know you're not here, Dr. X, whoever your two doctors were. He just said, he, you know, he just obliterated us because he said there were no, you know, the study doesn't mean anything. And I'm, so Hochberg is now testifying based on my knowledge, experience, world expert. I wouldn't treat her. Moreover, there's nothing in the study that is helpful because there were no cancer patients. There were patients with cancer. 
I can only answer that the same way I answered Justice Cowen's question on essentially the same point, which is Mr. Brakeson did the best he could under the circumstance. He believed that his cross-examination using the report, which did not contain the exclusion criteria, was as effective as it could have been at the time. In hindsight, could he have done that? Yes, he could have done that. Yes, but why is that a ground for a motion for new trial? Just because he could have done something that he, in hindsight, could have and should have done. He didn't do it. He did it the very next day after the – why did he do it the next day? Why did he even bother to do it? Why didn't he do it the day before? That isn't a ground for a motion for new trial. The, the grounds for the new trial is the fact that false testimony was provided on a central issue to the case. And Justice Kottmeyer indulged the defendant, indulged the expert in every way for six months to find a basis for that testimony. And I'd just like to point out that he didn't say that he actually reviewed the CD-ROM, but it turned out he never even had the CD-ROM. Mr. Gould, Mr. Gould said, don't get the CD-ROM. But what was the false testimony that he presented to the jury that mattered? There were no cancer patients included in the study. That was false testimony. That was false testimony. Well, you still don't know that there were no patients who presented with active cancer, I thought, is the answer. But that's not what he testified to, Your Honor. He said there were zero cancer patients. He said there were none in the study. And he made it clear, and the judge who was there, judging the tone of his voice, his certitude, and the impact on the jury, believed and found, as a matter of fact, that this was a significant issue that may have well affected the central issue of the case. But didn't you just answer Justice Osmond's question that to this day you don't have any evidence that there were patients with cancer in the study? Active. 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 That's the distinction. There are 59 patients with cancer in the study. Cancer history. And if we go to the chief biostatistician, the person who knows more about the data in this case than anybody in the world, she doesn't have that data. All she knows is 59 cancer patients are in there. And I'd just like to point out. So I take it your point is if the jury, if a second jury is told by one expert, one expert, this woman, your client, was a classic candidate for this treatment when she showed up at the emergency room, and I assume your experts say this is the treatment, TPA, I would have recommended. Is that what they said? Yes. And you get another expert who says, you know, I would never recommend that. Right? And then when it comes to the study, there's going to be a fight as to whether the study supports either one of them. Maybe the study isn't even admissible now. I don't know. Correct? That's what you're saying. I would suggest, Your Honor, that there won't be any other witness who will take the stand if this case is retried who's going to say there were no cancer patients in the study. No, no, I understand that. I understand that. And now everybody knows, and maybe one of them says there's nothing to suggest that somebody presenting with cancer is in the study, and the other side is going to say there's nothing to suggest that anybody presenting with cancer isn't in the study. All we know is 59 cancer patients were in the study. But what about the statement that nobody with a major illness was included in the study? Well, that was an exclusion. No, it's not with a major illness. It's with a significant illness that will affect the study. And Dr. Tilley explained that in her deposition. If I'm about to die and I go into the emergency room with a stroke, they're not going to give me TPA because in three months when they want to follow up, I'm six feet under. So they're looking for people who are going to survive long enough for the study to determine whether or not the drug had an effect on them. That's the point. And how do you know that? How do you know that that is the basis for the exclusion? That's what Dr. Tilley testified to. She's the chief biostatistician. That's how we know. So she said it was only a matter of will you survive long enough? The criteria on the serious concomitant illness was meant to get rid of patients who might not be around for the follow-up, where the illness would preclude the follow-up with those patients. Were the listed conditions that were going to exclude people? No. Things that were likely to have them dead in, what, a few months? That was in the discretion of the researchers, which, again, are all around the country. So what you're at least suggesting, at least suggesting that if somebody has a form of cancer and is either has just recently finished a course of treatment but where the prognosis is good, 
or they are getting towards the end of the treatment and the prognosis is good, they might have been among those 59 patients who, quote, had cancer. Absolutely. And, and furthermore, specifically with regard to this case, Dr. Carragher called the oncologist for Mrs. Wojcicki and said, do you think she has metastatic cancer, which is what everybody seemed to dwell on a trial on the defense side. He said, no, I believe she does not have metastatic cancer. That's in the medical records. And uh, this whole business about the cancer really became a rationalization at trial that was not part of the original treatment. If I could just make one point that I think is very important. Dr. Hochberg testified that the sole basis for his saying there were no cancer patients was this phone call to Dr. Tilly the day the trial started, which she denies having even occurred because she was in a different state at the time the call happened. He asked her, would this patient have been in the study? And he says that she said no. She denies that. The judge found, as a matter of fact, that the overwhelming evidence was that conversation never took place. And even if it had taken place, how does the fact that one patient would not have been in the study have supported Dr. Hochberg's testimony that there were no cancer patients in the study? This case is very important, Your Honors, to support the integrity of the trial court. We ask that you affirm this decision. You affirm the orders that were well-reasoned, well-supported. The defendants have failed to demonstrate that there were any erroneous findings of fact. They failed to demonstrate that Judge Kottmeyer abused her discretion. And this, this is important to tell your trial justices that you ha they have the right, they have the power, and that they have the duty to uphold the integrity of the court. Thank you, Thank Mr. Warnke.